Hey, everyone. Welcome to From the Kitchen Table. I'm Sean Duffy, along with my co-host for the podcast and my wife, Rachel Campos Duffy. It's great to be back, Sean. This week, we celebrated our anniversary. We did. 24 years. 24 years and nine kids, which is kind of plays into the topic we have because there's a new study out of the University of Ohio, and it examined couples and saw that if the couple, the spouses, the more siblings they had in their childhood, the less likely they are to divorce. So kids, big families, might be the solution to the divorce rate, which in the United States right now is at 45% of all marriages end in divorce. Yeah, and when we read the study, it it makes a lot of sense, right? That if if you're raised in a home with more kids, more siblings, um, there are skills that you learn as a child. You learn how to, to fight, how to argue, how to forgive, how to debate. Um, and when you go through this complicated, you know, life of childhood, it doesn't end, right? You're part of a family and you can't get away. You can't leave. You can't, you know, ask to be a, you know, to be put up for adoption. You can't divorce your siblings. You can't divorce them. <laughs> you have to learn to work it out. And the skill sets that you that you that you garner in that early childhood with other siblings is really effective in helping you navigate your own marriage um, when you get to that place in your life. You know, it really plays out, I think, in our marriage, and I've seen it through the years. So, for those who don't know, Sean is the tenth of eleven kids. So, I'm one of four, and I thought we were kind of a big family growing up, um, but we weren't. Uh, <laughs> you have you know, 11 kids in your family. And when I met you, um, and by the way, my dad is one of 15. So it's not like I didn't see big families. And instantly when I met you, one of the things, especially after we got married, is in our marriage, I think you have played a very effective role of managing our arguments and our fights, which is part of being married, right? And I have always attributed that to the fact that you had a lot of siblings, that when you have a big family and lots of different personalities, and, and by the way, the, the number one thing you realize when you have a lot of kids is how different each one of them are. Yeah. It doesn't I mean they're the same family and they're so very, very different. And so that same seeds, same family <laughs> and really different kids, which is really right. remarkable. And you have, you know, when you have 11 kids in your family, you have to manage 11 different personalities. And I have always felt that that was something that you brought to our marriage. Can, can I take a, a side trip here? You were sure. reading the comments on the article that came out. This is on the Daily Mail. Yeah, this is so funny. So this article, this, I love the Daily Mail. I'm not going to lie. Um, I love the Daily Mail. And what I love the most about the Daily Mail are the comments. So I, if I love an article, I can't wait to get through the article so I can get to the comments. And I read, this, I read the comments in this article. And um, a lot of A lot of people were like, I don't believe this study. Um, One woman said, my husband was one of, you know, nine kids. And I think because he never got enough attention in his own family, he's a selfish bastard now. (laughs) So there were definitely people that, I mean, look, there's exceptions to every rule. Right. And so I I will note that being raised in a big family, um, oftentimes you don't feel like you're hurt or there's not enough attention of the parents to go around to all the kids. And even in our family with nine kids, yeah, Sometimes no they feel like there's there's not enough of two parents to go around, and That's true. Um, it's 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 a very real thing. But um, and by the way, I think in this age of very entitled kids, I think. That's not necessarily the worst thing that can happen yep. that, you know, you don't think you're the center of the universe and that everything has to drop because you said a word or you want something. But, you know, it can be challenging to try and spread yourself out. And there are definitely times when a kid needs you and you probably aren't there at the level you need to be because there's a lot of you and there's a yeah. lot going on. Um, that said, I still think that there is real um, power to to this story. And so they say. Um, You know, that if you're surrounded by a large family, you're honing social skills from a very young age. Um, The study believes that the results are because those, you know, spouses that come out of these big families tend to be more resilient and better able to cope with the ups and downs of relationships. And boy, that I have to say, I I think it's true. And there's some social intelligence that comes yes. from being in a big family. You, you can read a situation. And I know that my, my own, our own kids, 
that there's kids that will read a situation and try to calm it down. And I have other kids that will read a bad situation and try to throw fuel on the fire, but they're very socially smart. They know how to read and navigate situations. And you get that with the craziness with the more kids. And you, to, and you learn to navigate lots of different personalities. So like if you're an only child, you know, your dad has one personality, your mom has one personality, you have one personality. So you learn to manage three, but just think you learn to manage, uh, 12, uh, 13 personalities, your mom, right. your dad, all your siblings, and, and, and how That's they right. interact, and also how those personalities interact with each other. Let, now, me, let, me, let me just speak on, on, on my own family. Sure. So, so my mom um, and my dad were Republicans growing up. This is not a political commentary. But my mom was kind mom of... Was a little, she was always a liberal at heart. Sean. A little granola ass, so, but like she was eating nori rolls and sushi, you know, in the 80s. She was, you know, she was shopping organically. Yeah, no, she was you know, definitely ahead of her time. She was There's ahead no of her question. time, right. In northern Wisconsin, like crazy. But... They also kind of had to do some counseling because of one of my brothers, and they did develop a, a, a lot of good skill sets in how to communicate and how to argue and how to fight. And, and you know, whether it's um, listening, right? You have one mouth and two ears. When you get in a fight, you can't actually just yell over each other. You have to have enough respect. And I need to listen to what you're saying and hear what you're saying and then be able to respond to it and ask for the same respect from you. Yeah. But very simple things in fighting that but there people were two, don't there do. There were two stages in the family. So it's, it's interesting because I'm fascinated, especially when I met the Duffies, I became even more fascinated with birth order. So there were eight kids in Sean's family that were born in the span of 10 years. And now, now that I'm a mom, I'm Ooh. like, I think your mom is a saint. Eight kids in 10 years. And there was a gap. And then there were three more. And Sean is part of that last bit of the litter, right? He's right. the end of the litter. He's Best the second to last of the 11. Best space to be. Yes. And what's interesting is what you just said, that in between, before they had this last set of litter, of the litter, <laughs> um, of the brood, they had this, you know, situation in the family occur where the family ended up going to counseling. And really kind of unpacked a lot of really bad habits and, and different kinds of communication skills that they could improve on. And they actually, to the, your parent and parents and your family's credit, they actually took it to heart. It right. was a serious issue and they took it to heart and realized there was something kind of dysfunctional not happening right in the family. And they made these massive changes um, in, in the way the family ran. And then Sean being in the, you know, coming after that, really was the beneficiary was. of some really great changes in his family. You know, by the way, kudos to counseling. It does work. That's right. Um, it does work. Yes, you're having trouble. Go to counseling. Yeah, it it not, can don't work be for you. Get skill sets that are necessary to navigate the person that you love and, and the relationship that you have with them. I talked about this in a, in a previous podcast, but this was the time frame in which my dad came home. I don't know if I was like seven or eight years old. And hugged me for the first time, and I was like, "Wow, oh, this is really weird." My dad's hugging me. Uh, <laughs> and now and, Sean's a big hugger. And ever since like, then, we've become um, we're a very hugging family. But before that time, like no one hugged him. My my mom would give me a hug, but my dad doesn't hug anybody. It was really bizarre he's when a he big started. Hugger now. He's and still now a he kind is. of awkward hugger, but he hugs. He's a hugger. Yeah, he's a hugger. And so am I, and we hug our but kids. But you're not an awkward hugger. I know I'm not. I'm, I dive right in. Um, <laughs> you know, but. Some of our kids are awkward huggers. <laughs> <laughs> we hug a lot too. Um, so but, yeah, I think I think that that's that's really interesting. But it is what's fascinating about the message of this um, study that more kids are actually a um, an anecdote to the to, not an anecdote a a prescription. Yeah. You know the a little solution. Tough one, a little tough one to America. The solution to divorce in America is just more kids. And, mm. and so it's interesting because this is the opposite message that's being sent in the culture. Right now, um, it, it, by the way, our culture advocates for if you're married, don't have kids. But if preferable, don't, don't get married at all. Right. Um, the number one song right now is uh, Miley Cyrus. It's called Flowers. I want to read you the lyrics of this. Um, she said in, in her song, um, I can take myself dancing. I can hold my own hand. By the way, this is a play off of that Bruno Mars song. Mm -hmm. I should have brought you flowers, held your hand. So she, it's kind of got the same uh, lyrics and, and tune to it. But this, it's very catchy, by the way. I love Miley Cyrus' song. It's great. Um, but listen to the message. message. The message is, 
I can take myself dancing. I can hold my uh, my own hand. I can love me better than you can. There were some other lyrics in there. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, again, can you can you really hold your own hand? Is it more fun to go dancing alone, Sean? Do I have the rest of the lyrics? I can find myself. Do you really? I mean, listen, sometimes I buy myself flowers, but I prefer when Sean buys me flowers. Um, but again, do you want to go dancing on your own? Do you want, and that's the message. Um, you look at so many articles now saying, you know, is, is marriage necessary? Um, and then there's these TikTok videos. You and I talked about them before where all these married, but without kids or some sort of acronym for them. I can't remember. Um, but married people, no kids making TikTok videos of just how relaxing and awesome their life is. And frankly, I, I looked at the, the first few seconds of them waking, like they get, all get to sleep in on Saturdays. We were, I don't ever get to sleep in on Saturdays anyway anymore because of my job. But, um, but there was a time that I it's could have, yeah. and I never did because we had all these little kids. So uh, the, the first part of the TikTok video where they're, you know, getting to sleep in, I could, I was like, yeah. But then as the TikTok video went on and they're making themselves lattes and they're, you know, deciding where they want what do they want to do? And they go to movies alone and also, I mean, it seems so boring. Well, so I think when you look at that, you'd say, and well, empty. I think the, soulless. the evidence when you do studies would show that if you lead a, a, a single life only focused on yourself, buying yourself flowers, taking yourself dancing, waking up late on a Saturday, making yourself a latte, you can present it as very glamorous on TikTok um, or in a song. But if you look at studies on who are the most happy people yeah. in America, yeah, and there have been studies, like long-term studies, University of Chicago. Tell and us about the studies, Rachel. University of Chicago and um, Brigham also Young. Brigham Young have done the studies. And as they look at them, uh, the happiest subgroup in America are married conservative women. Oh, my goodness, married conservative women. Right here. And who are the least happy group in that so subset? Why don't I take you through the category? So sure. happiest are married uh, conservative women. Then... Conservative men come next, then liberal women, least happy liberal men. Liberal men. <laughs> and, and I think w what that is, is in the sense that if you have a family and you have kids and you give of yourself and your time, there's something that fulfills the human heart when you do that. And um, when you just live for yourself, it becomes very empty. I, I, God made us in a way that says you're just you're not there to live for yourself and you will not be f f fulfilled if that's the road you take, actually give of yourself to others um, and to your family and to your spouse. And when you do that, people are, 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 are filled up. And even people of faith, because your faith will teach you that you shouldn't be selfish. You should actually volunteer your time. You should give your time away to others. Um, you should serve others, not yourself. And Christians actually do that, and they find themselves to be more happy when they do do it. Actually, there's another study that is really revealing this one looked at just women and showed that women who reported that they made a, this is so countercultural, but it's, it's true. Women who made a professional sacrifice. So they basically sacrificed their own professional advancement for the sake of their family reported higher levels of happiness. That is the opposite of what you remember Sheryl Sandberg, this, I think she was the CFO of um, Facebook. Of Facebook. She wrote that famous book, Lean In. Um, and she would tell young women, you know, at commencement addresses, put your get your foot on the gas pedal and go, 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 go. And it was all like, you know, really advance yourself. That's the key to, to happiness is, is your career and, and, you know, advancing yourself professionally. And yet when you look at happiness studies, those who, you know, didn't do that report higher levels of happiness. And so I think it kind of goes back to... Because what's, what's sure. sad about that is you only get one life. You only, get, so you, know, you only get one 21, you only get one 28, one 33. You don't get to redo these. And so if, if you listen to the culture, if you listen to Miley Cyrus or you listen to Sheryl Sandberg, you might make choices in your life that later on in your life, you'll look back and reflect on it and go, I'm not happy. I wish I would have done something else. And you can't go back and relive it. And I was just a, a story from, from our marriage and our life. Rachel was up for The View um, with Barbara Walters. She was auditioning live. Um, we were we just were, married. We were just married. 
And Rachel, we made, we made a deal. If Rachel got the view, we talked about this in our previous podcast, but if Rachel got the view, we would move to New York. If she didn't get the view, she had to come with me to Wisconsin. And that, was, that was the bet. <laughs> that she, was the deal. Yeah, yeah, she didn't get the view and she came to Wisconsin. And in hindsight, I might go, you know, even though she didn't get the view, she could have had a very prosperous career in TV because everyone was watching this live audition uh, on the view. And, you know, you could have maybe not the view, but you would have gone somewhere else. Yeah. And instead, you made a sacrifice and you came and focused on our family, our, our new baby. Um, and you focused on my career, which was very helpful to me. We were very poor. Um, but it, in the end, it worked out. You had some delayed gratification. You talk about being the Betty White of television. Yeah. Where, I eventually got back into TV, but I was almost 50 at the time. Yeah, and, <laughs> I and, and here you, you... But I got nine kids along the way, and yeah, I... Have a lot no of life regret. experience, and yeah. you got to live in a lot of places, and you got to do what you love right now, and so you, you kind of were able to come full circle and, and get it all, which is really cool. Um, and had you made a different set of choices at 50 years old, you might have professionally been in a different place, you mean but you're so... Social- Whenever. If you made a different choice when you were 25, yeah. when you're now at 50, you might have a, I might a, have different, a different life. life. A totally different life. And I would hope to think that you think this one is pretty good after 24 years of marriage. But I, I um, think I made the right choice, for sure. And look, everybody has to make the choice that works for them. And I think the only message that I, I hope people take from this is, you know, be careful about the message that are being sent out in the culture. They're very powerful. I mean, you see Miley Cyrus's video, she's dancing around in her really amazing house and blah, 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 blah. Or you see these TikTok videos or you read these articles that are denigrating marriage and basically saying, you know, here's all the benefits of going solo. But in the end, you know, at the end of life, right. if you want to move all the way back you know, to the end, you know, you're, you know, who's going to be around you and holding your hand in, in that final moment? You know, is it going to be a nurse that you don't know, <laughs> or is it going to be, it's, it's definitely not going to be your boss. Your corporations don't love you. I tell this to young people all the time. You know, it's great to have a great job and work for a company or work, have it's a wonderful. nice boss. It's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing. Um, it's, you know, it's how we put food on the table, but just understand your corporation doesn't love you. Um, they're never, it's not, it's not, it's not meant to love you. People will love you. Children will love you. Friends will love you. Your husband will love you. Your wife will love you. And in the end of life, you know, these are things that you need to think about. And um, we have a a good friend who was, uh, who is a cardiologist. And who who do you think I was? I'll just go ahead. I was talking about our friend who's a cardiologist who is around people who are, you know, near the end of death, uh, end of life. And he says biggest, I asked him one time, I said, what's the biggest regret people have when they're at the end of life? And he said, they regret not having had more kids. Yeah. And hospice care workers um, will often say, listen, it might be, I wish I would have not been as focused on my career and spent more time with my family. I would have yeah, taken more time off that. and had more time raising my kids. I wish I would have had more kids. Um, but rarely, I don't think ever, do you see hospice care workers go, well, as, they, as they serve people in, at the end of life, where someone's like, you know, I wish I would have been more selfish. Yeah. I wish I would have spent more time on me. Yeah. I wish I would have made more money. I wish I would have had a higher promotion. And that's the kind of, when I left Congress, I kind of made that assessment. I'm like, at the end of life, do I want to be like, hey, listen, I passed that bill and I got elected so many times and I got this percent of vote, but my kids didn't know me and I'm not around as much as I would like to be. Oh. Or do I want to make a decision where, you know what, what's the most important thing in life? And it's being with your family. And we all have jobs. We all have to work. But if you don't have time in your life, because your job is taking you away from your family, you should reassess that. And I was, in, I was by the way, I love Congress. I had, I loved it. It was such an honor to serve and we served together. But at one point, again, people will bash members of Congress, but you, you do give a lot of your time. A lot of your oh, life is I don't away. Think people understand how much time it takes and, to be, and to have that job. And it's a wonderful, wonderful honor to serve, but it does take away from your family. And I wanted to go back to my family. And that, that kind of happened for me when we had Valentina. She was on, she was on the way. We knew she was going to have Down syndrome. She was going to have a heart condition. You're already home with eight kids, and we're going to put this one on the plate and me be gone. We said, you know what? Um, fix my shirt I'll for me. Thank you. You know, we also, we did know people in Congress who had been there a long, long, long time and had made, um, I think, it, you know, it just became 
who they were. And I think, yeah. and, and they, they also lost a lot family wise. And so it was also interesting to be in that position to kind of see people who made different kinds of choices and go, what do I want to do? And, um, it's definitely one. And by the way, it was I, just a side note. My calendar was full. Like every 15 minutes was scheduled in Congress. I mean, literally I was, you have two schedulers in Congress. One for back at home in your district, and one two in Congress. Two full-time schedules to manage. To, schedule to, to manage schedule the, the 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 day and the life of a member of Congress. When I left, I literally had I had a dentist appointment on my calendar. That was it. It was the weirdest and yeah. scariest thing for me to go. I I don't have to be anywhere. No one wants me. No, I don't have to go anywhere. Um, and it took me a little while to get used to that. Yeah. But it was. It's then turned into a really great set of years since Congress that we've had more time together as a family. Yeah. Which is, by the way, well, listen, I love Wisconsin. When you got the job in uh, at um, uh, on Fox and Friends, we decided that we would move to New Jersey so we could all be together. So again, I, I mean, I've gone off on a, a tangent, but again, making decisions that work for your family, for your love, for your kids, at the end of life will make you happier. Yeah, and also like as you're making the, you know, as you know, you're when you are married, a lot of people think. You know, they see kids as a negative, right? Like you hear AOC talking about, <laughs> you know, you can't, you know, she's like, we should definitely have a discussion about the ethics of having kids, the ethics of having kids given climate change, right? right. You had Harry and Meghan Markle. Uh, Harry was interviewed in British Vogue and he said, you know, definitely we will not have more than two because. You know, that's what we owe the earth god, I guess. <laughs> he said climate change. He didn't say earth god. But, um, you know, essentially he said it would be irresponsible of me and Megan to have more than two children. That's his arbitrary number. Because, you know, the Duffies are environmental terrorists, right? And um, we're going to have to offset the Duffy <laughs> number of, of children. So there's a lot of forces at telling people that, it's not just that you're going to have a better life if you have less, less kids. Um, I think there was Seth, uh, Seth Rogen was, you know, the other day, the other day had a uh, interview where he talked about how great it is, how much more fun him and his wife are having because they've made the decision not to have kids. But also then this thing with AOC and Meghan Markle, where people actually think they're more virtuous for not having, having as many kids. Oh, wait, we, and yet this study says you're actually that. prepared. The more kids you have, the better prepared those kids are for having long-lasting, happy marriages. And what could be more important than that? Yeah, so the culture is lying to you. And by the way, so we'll go to dinner with all our kids, including Valentina. And sometimes I'm like, listen, wouldn't it be great to just have us go to dinner together? We went to dinner for our we anniversary, did go yesterday. That which was we, nice. don't, we don't do that enough. And I was like, isn't this nice? It was enjoyable to actually <laughs> no be by ourselves. No one's crying. I'm not cutting anyone's food. That was enjoyable. But if you did that, if I did that every day, I would miss having dinner and the craziness of having our kids, right? Yeah. It was more yeah. fulfilling. So again, if, if, if you're thinking about having kids, one is fulfilling for you, but you're, you're teaching your kids, if you have several of them, how to be better spouses when they grow up and get married, the success of a long lasting marriage is going to come from giving them siblings to learn how to fight and to argue um, and to forgive. All of those things are really important if you're going to have a successful marriage. Because if you can't fight, you can't argue, and you can't forgive in a marriage, it won't last. Um, so it really, it's, this, it's kind of a no-brainer. It makes complete sense that those two things would, would go together. Yeah. Um, I, saw, I saw something, I think this comedian who has, uh, Gaffigan, who has like a lot, I think he has like five or six kids. And he said that um, seeing big, he said, he was talking about having big, a big family and, and what it's like to, to be out and think about when you're sitting out in public with all your, all your kids, he says, it's kind of like, um, the waterbed, like back in the day, it seemed, it was really cool and, and right. everyone had them. And now when you see them, it's really weird. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of us. Um, but every now and then when I travel, I meet, I do meet people who have a lot of kids and our kids go to a school where there are lots of families. Yes. With lots kids. of kids. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's coming back. Maybe it's not. Um, but yeah, a simple thing, too. When we go to church sometimes, it's crazy because sometimes we like to pay attention to the mass. It's hard to pay attention with Valentina. Because she's a terrorist. She is a terrorist. But I went, I went to, the, to the Easter vigil because I did Maria's. Maria yeah, we had, to, we had to conquer and divide for Easter Sunday. So Sean took how many? You took? I took four, five. Five. Oh, five. I took five. Five kids. And then 
me and my older daughter went the next day. We kept Valentina home. And as kinda, if you're did, Catholic, you know the vigil is longer, right? So it was about a two-hour mass, which was not as long as it could have been, but it was two hours. Yeah, sometimes they're three hours. And about 20 minutes in, the the six-year-old down, and then Sleeping. 20 minutes later, the nine-year-old down on my lap, so I couldn't stand up. I couldn't kneel down. Which is a big part of the, the Easter vigil is up and, and down. And then the nine-year-old was like, how long is this mass? I'm getting tired. I'm like, oh, God. I was so... But, but you know did. what? When I left the church, um, Margaret said how well behaved they were. Because they were sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's no, why. I mean, by the way, I had drool on both legs. <laughs> they as they were sleeping on me. But you know what? Um, <laughs> yeah, they did. They were drooling. Uh, it was, but, and we probably should have, we thought that a little one should have gone in the morning with you and should have taken the older one. Okay, but, this is, this is the, we have to find out this one. <laughs> So anyway, anyway, well, it's, it was an interesting article, a lot to think about, a lot to think about the messages young people are getting. I'm actually going to the University of Dallas this week to talk about sort of related subjects like happiness and the messages that the culture is giving young people and um, giving them a different way of sort of processing all the information they're getting uh, that I think is is not leading to happiness. I think if you look at the the, you know, mental health issues kids are having, the depression, the suicide. Detachment. The detachment. There's a lot going on. Um, these phones are part of it, but it's also all these other messages going on. And how do we live happy, fulfilling lives that, um, and, and so I think it's, it's just a great conversation mm-hmm. to have. I'm so happy to have it with these students. Be, things that are easy. Listen, it is easy to sleep in on Saturday. It's easy to make yourself a latte. Things in life that are hard are the most fulfilling, right? If if you study hard and get a good grade on a test, that's fulfilling. Um, getting a good job and advancing in work is fulfilling. Working hard to, to accomplish that. Or if you're on a sports team, working hard and accomplishing success in sports, but also working hard to raise a good family, working hard at a good marriage. All Everything that fulfills you takes hard work. And it seems like the culture is, in a lot of ways, saying, take the easy way out. It's a way easier, happier path for you just to skate along. And I think you have to question the culture. And I don't think enough people are questioning the the new themes and ideas that are coming out from culture that are bold-faced, flat-out lies. Yeah, and they're also statistically lying because they'll say things like, so one is like, you know, subjective. Are you happier, you know, living for yourself? Are you happier living, you know, with a a husband or wife and, and, you know, kids? I mean, those are to some degree, subjective questions. But they'll also imply that, you know, you'll you'll be more prosperous if you just focus on yourself, if you don't have kids or if you don't get married. And it's a lie. All the data, the census data proves that when, you know, couples are, are married and when they have children, they actually make more money. And it makes sense. They yes. pull resources together. So, you know, you're able, you have these economies of scale that happen because you're pulling resources together. But there is something biological, and this is also very controversial because we're supposed to not believe in biology anymore. But there is something that is super transformative for men in particular. That's right. When men get married and they become responsible for a woman and children, something in them just shifts. And I saw it with you, Sean, when we, when we got married, we didn't have hardly any money at all. Sean was, you know, fresh out of law school, working at his dad's office. There wasn't enough money to go around. And you were doing, still doing lumberjack shows to make money on the weekend, which he was doing before. And in between, this is such a great story. I'm so glad we're talking about this. I wasn't excited to talk about this. So when Sean does a lumberjack show, it, it usually is three shows in a day. So he would go on these weekends. He would go to some location um, and they would do three shows a day. And in between, and you're tired after you do one of those yeah. shows. It's, it's exhausting. You're chopping, you're sawing, you're climbing. Um, it's a really intense. How long are those shows? It's about a half an hour show. And it's like, it is an intense workout for a half an hour, three times a day. It's, it, yeah, you got to be in good shape, which I didn't realize until I'm older and fatter. Yeah, no, you were in <laughs> an incredible shape. I mean, it was like amazing. And what in between shows, sometimes he would make these little wooden chairs because with his um, chainsaw. Uh, chainsaw he could make these little chairs. As part, of the sh- as part of the show, we would we would do this skit where we'd make a, uh, a chair and give it to a kid in the crowd. And then we would make chairs to sell after the show. And because people like, had just seen it in the show. They're, they're like, oh, chair. 
And they would make these, have these, make them in between, and then so. in the next show, sell them for like you know fifteen bucks, whatever. Sean would usually make a few of them, and then he could you know pocket a little bit of money. The drinking money, right? That's what it was. <laughs> it was drinking money. Before it I was, was married, it was drinking money. It was drinking money. <laughs> well, once we had Evita, our first, suddenly that money. We needed it. And so between shows, Sean was making so many chairs. And he would come home with all this money for making chairs. But I don't Full think- of sawdust, dirty, my back hurt. But I, there's no yeah. way you would have spent as much time between shows when you're exhausted making that many chairs. It was like something shifted. You knew you had to take care of this little family. Yeah. And you had to figure out how to make that money. And that happens to men. And yet, of course, there are some men who don't take care of their kids. But Most by and large... Most men, it's a biological thing. They rise you know, to the they're occasion. built that way. They got to protect their families, and so in any in any way, families end up doing better. People end up having more money. The the more you know, uh, they when they're married, and the more kids they have, because the the husband in particular feels a real pressure. Pressure. And that pressure is really good um, to make them perform. And again, you'll be better off. And also, a, a wife can help you strategize. Right? It's like. Right. Two, two brains are more than one strategizing on your career. You help me strategize on what I'm going to do with my career. I help you strategize with your career. And that also... And because we think differently, like someone, something might happen in Congress, and I'd be like... And she'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, hold on a second. Let's think that through. Yeah. Maybe we should take a different approach, right? right? So if left to my own devices, I may take one track... I tell Rachel the story and she's like, no, 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 no. Listen, hold on a second. There's another perspective here. You should think about it a little bit differently. And I'm better off and more successful because I think I took a smarter track because the advice she was giving me, right? You're, we're, we're the, we we're the best. We do that both ways, yeah. We're the best advice givers, counselors for each other. Um, and you're more successful when you have someone else to ping things off of. Of um, course. And you, and you completely do that. So don't listen to the culture. If you want to have success, you want to have happiness, um, Talk to people around you who are happy. It's like if if you're if you want to be masculine as a man, look at masculine men and what do they do? Look at Dan Bongino. What does Dan Bongino <laughs> do? What does um, what does what's his name? Uh, uh, big bald head. Jocko. What does Jocko do? I mean, look at Jocko. There's a lot of young men that look at Jocko. I know, right? So, but 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 see see what they do. Um, to be masculine. And if you want to go, how do I, how do I find happiness? Look to people who are happy and the decisions they've made. And then look to the people who are miserable, not faking happiness, but miserable people and ask them about the choices that they've made. And I think you'll find that it matches with the study that Rachel just brought up. Get married, have kids, help your kids out, teach them to learn how to fight and argue and forgive. So they will be better spouses when they get married in the future. All right. Well, it's a great study. I'm glad we got to talk about it a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward to my speech at my daughter's university at University of Dallas. And um, that's it for today. Yeah, listen, if you like a podcast. And happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Mm. Ooh, wow. <laughs> TMI. Um, if you like a podcast, you can rate, <laughs> review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast. I did write um, that one down for you this time. Did you? I did. I did. I printed it for you. Well, you printed so it. But I don't... Producer... Well, it's not here. Dylan wouldn't be... Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. Yeah, there we go. This this is is such. Yes, here we go. If you've enjoyed the, if you've enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, let us know. Subscribe, rate, review this podcast at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download your podcasts. Listen ad free with a Fox News podcast a plus subscription or on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members, you, you, you can listen to this show ad free on the Amazon Music app. Was that a good pitch? Little (laughs) reading. Good. Sunday, good. Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> Listen, thank you guys for tuning in. Please subscribe. Uh, we love doing this podcast. And by the way, it is from our kitchen table. All right. God bless. Have Bye, a good, everybody. Have a good week.